Uh, my name is Bob, and uh, it's my pleasure to be addressing all assembled here on the second floor of Pearson's Hall today in the Moore Study Lounge, as well as uh, the uh, millions tuning in uh, via the web all around uh, our planet Earth. Uh, and at the fore of the, everyone's mind, uh, of course, uh, these days is uh, the question which uh, 68 teams deserve to be playing in our uh, college basketball tournament here in the United States. Uh, these 68 teams were officially invited uh, two days ago on Selection Sunday, and Dominetrix is actually a ranking methodology that was um, developed by uh, a former colleague of mine at Beloit College, Scott Bollier, and myself in a paper that we wrote for the Journal of Sports Economics in February of 2011. Uh, and uh, uh, the whole idea is to uh, address uh, scenarios where there are multiple dimensions of performance and uh, develop a way to rank uh, entities, in this case basketball teams, uh, by taking into account all of those dimensions of performance on the basis of which dimensions are more important uh, and which dimensions are less important. Uh, the primary predecessor in the literature uh, ahead of our work is this paper by Laurent Cherche and Frederick Vermeulen, two European economists who used this methodology to rank cyclists from the Tour de France. Their paper was also published in the Journal of Sports Economics uh, five years before ours in 2006. Now, um, this methodology also gets applied outside the realm of sports in areas such as medicine, where you can rank different medical treatments uh, to address uh, problems like skin conditions such as psoriasis. And this has been done by uh, Newt Witkowski and his colleagues uh, as well. So what you'll notice as kind of the recurring themes in this literature, again, are multiple dimensions of performance and what's gonna be an ordinal methodology uh, to substitute for a cardinal approach which has unfortunate subjective elements that we'd like to eliminate. We want to generate a ranking methodology that is as objective as possible. Now, the primary metric used by the NCAA Selection Committee is the Rating Percentage Index, or RPI. And again, notice right off the bat that there are multiple dimensions of performance. A team's own winning percentage, uh, their opponent's winning percentage to gauge their strength of schedule, and their opponent's opponent's winning percentage to just make sure that that previous dimension, W2, is uh, for real. The RPI itself is a weighted average of these three dimensions of performance. These cardinal weights of 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and 0.25 are arguably arbitrary and subjective. Uh, furthermore, there are additional cardinal weights that emerge when a team's own winning percentage is adjusted depending on where games are played. Uh, a team is given credit for 1.4 wins anytime they win on the road, one win anytime they win on a neutral court, and 0.6 wins anytime they win at home. Here again, we're using somewhat arbitrary cardinal coefficients to compute adjusted wins and again, adjusted losses to get this first dimension of performance a team's own winning percentage. Now, there is some basis in empirical regularity for the weights chosen for adjusted wins and adjusted losses. And that can be found if you simply look at all home games played throughout the season. And let me update this through Sunday, March the 16th, through which home teams had won 3,094 games and lost 1,668. 
It's a winning percentage of 0.65 and a losing percentage of 0.35. Uh, if you multiply those two numbers by two to generate weights that average one, then you get cardinal coefficients of 1.3 and 0.7. But again, those are different from the ones that are used, 1.4 and 0.6. Furthermore, uh, this looks across all games played everywhere throughout this past season through Sunday, March 16th, and doesn't adjust for the fact that some home arenas are tougher to play in than other home arenas. So Wichita State uh, went undefeated this year. They play in the Missouri Valley Conference and go on the road against teams like Bradley in Peoria, Illinois, Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, Illinois State in, in uh, Bloomington. And arguably, winning in those uh, road games is uh, perhaps less difficult than what is faced by a team like Virginia. Uh, when they go on the road, they have to play at Cameron Indoor Stadium at Duke, uh, the Carrier Dome at Syracuse, the Dean Dome at the University of North Carolina, and they get, if they win in any of those very difficult arenas, they get the same 1.4 road wins that Wichita State gets by winning in Peoria and Bloomington and Carbondale. So again, nothing against the Missouri Valley Conference, uh, but uh, I think there would be broad agreement that it's tough to go on the road and uh, beat teams like Syracuse and Duke and North Carolina at their home arenas in comparison to Southern Illinois, Bradley, and Illinois State. Okay, so again, these cardinal coefficients are the source of the problem. And uh, we replace that with an ordinal methodology that simply, first of all, takes those cardinal weights and uses them to assess what's being deemed most important and what's being deemed least important. So if you look at the cardinal weights in the uh, uh, construction of the rating percentage index, it is the case that opponent's winning percentage emerges as most important. Let's call that the most important dimension of performance, D1. Your own performance away from home is next most important on the road and at neutral sites. Third most important, again, is the opponent's opponent's winning percentage, which again is there to make sure that this first dimension of performance uh, is actually uh, reflecting the truth. And last uh, and least most important is your own home winning percentage. Let's call that dimension of performance D4. Now, the ordinal methodology pioneered by people like Shersha and Vermeulen takes these dimensions of performance and makes sure that when we assess whether one team dominates another, that the most important dimension is always playing a role. Uh, the second most important dimension plays a role, you'll notice, in three of these four criteria. Uh, the third most important dimension just in the last two, and the fourth most important dimension only affects the final criterion. There's a fifth criterion which simply requires that one of these weak inequalities is strong, and if we didn't have that, it would be possible for a team to dominate itself, and that would be nonsensical. So uh, the best way to understand this is to, to apply it to an example. And so let's take some of the best teams in the United States this year and, for instance, begin with a comparison between, say, Arizona and Louisville. Uh, Arizona's opponents won 62% of their games. Louisville's opponents won 55% of their games. So, so far, Arizona is dominating Louisville. Now, when Arizona went away from home, they won 75% of the, their games. When Louisville went away from home, 
they won 81.25% of their games. But it's still the case that Arizona is dominating Louisville because what we compare, our first D1, the most important dimensions of performance for both teams, and then the sum D1 plus D2, the sum of the two most important dimensions, and since the amount by which Arizona prevails over Louisville in the most important dimension exceeds the amount by which Louisville prevails over Arizona in the second most important dimension through the first two, Arizona is still dominating Louisville. Now, as it turns out, Arizona has a better opponent's opponent's uh, winning percentage. And when they come home, Arizona wins 100% of their games. Louisville wins eight nights of their games. Uh, these third and fourth sums continue to reflect Arizona greater than Louisville. And as a result, Arizona dominates Louisville. Now, your dominetric is equal to the number of teams you dominate minus the number of teams that dominate you. If you look at Arizona and Florida, uh, Arizona is ahead through the first dimension. Florida turns around and does better in road and neutral games than Arizona, but Florida defeats Arizona in this second dimension by more than Arizona beats Florida in the first dimension. And when you take the sum, the two teams become uh, unrankable. Neither dominates the other. So sometimes there's a dominance relationship. Arizona dominates Louisville. Other times there's no dominance relationship, as for example, between Arizona and Florida. In this little four-team table, Arizona dominates Louisville and Syracuse. So does Florida. Uh, no dominance relationship between Arizona and Florida. No dominance relationship between Louisville and Syracuse. So uh, Arizona and Florida would ultimately generate dominatrix of two. They each dominate two teams. Uh, Louisville and Syracuse dominatrix of minus two. Notice that they're playing a zero-sum game with each other. Uh, now, when we wrote this paper, there were 343 teams in Division I of the NCAA. Uh, now there are 349. And to construct a table like this to include all 349 teams and compute the dominatrics, you need the assistance of a computer. So let me tip my hat to my friend Rama Viswanathan of the chemistry department, uh, who I went to to uh, work with on an Excel program that, that he wrote for us uh, that implements this ranking methodology. Uh, our appendix to our paper in the Journal of Sports Economics. Uh, uh, thanks, Rama, for helping us out with this. And I just reproduce uh, that appendix in order to uh, thank him here again in, in today's uh, lunchbox talk. Uh, we need data as well, and we draw them from NCAA.com and uh, another website uh, that has good basketball data called WarrenNolan.com. What emerges is this great big table uh, of all teams, and uh, Arizona's dominatric across uh, all 349 teams is 340. Notice that the maximum possible dominatric you could attain would be 348, given the existence of 349 teams. But recall that, for instance, Arizona did not dominate Florida. Uh, that's how they lost one of their dominatrics on the way down from 348 to 340. So, uh, dominatrix ranks Arizona as the best team in the country. Uh, the selection committee on Sunday ranked Florida as the best team in the country. Dominatrix has Florida ranked second. They both got one seeds from the NCAA and Dominetrix would give each of these two teams a one seed as well. Dominetrix third number one seed would go to Wisconsin for all of you uh, Badgers fans. I think we got an alum over here. And uh, the fourth one seed would go to yet another Big Ten team, the University of Michigan. The fourth number one seed 
given by the NCAA Selection Committee this past Sunday went to Wichita State, and Dominetrics ranks Wichita State as the 34th best team in the United States. Now, the reason for this is because of the D1, uh, the dimension of performance with regard to opponents' winning percentage. Wichita State's opponents won 54.5% of their games. And that does not compare very favorably with the 60 or so percent being won by uh, our other number one seeds. Uh, and it's primarily for this region, reason that Dominetrics would give Wichita State a nine seed, even though the NCAA Selection Committee gave them a one seed. Now, uh, it's also interesting each year to uh, look at the so-called bubble to see uh, which teams on the bubble got selected and which teams did not. Uh, the first team that Dominetrics would have put in the tournament that the NCAA Selection Committee did not is Florida State. Dominetrics ranks them 39th best in the country. What's helping them is the fact that their opponent's winning percentage ranked 37th best in the country. And again, this is the most important dimension of performance. So we would have uh, invited Florida State, uh, home, by the way, of our Upton Scholar this year, James Gortney. Uh, and we would have also invited our friends from Urbana-Champaign at the University of Illinois. Uh, they deserved uh, a bid. Uh, they played the 39th most difficult schedule in the country. Uh, and our friends out in uh, California, in Berkeley, and across the Bay Bridge, in the city proper, the University of San Francisco, according to Dominetrics, uh, should have been invited to the tournament as well. Now let me note that the bubble bursts at 48. Uh, by the time you hit 48, 12 conferences have been represented. There are 32 conferences in the United States. So 20 more automatic qualifiers uh, make the tournament. 68 teams are in the field. When you bring in those other 20 automatic qualifiers, that makes the bubble burst at 48. So San Francisco is in. Southern Mississippi is out. Um, now, it's interesting to look at the four teams that the NCAA Selection Committee chose for the tournament that Dominetrics would not. They include Xavier. Notice that Xavier had an RPI of 47 underneath the bubble. Um, Kansas State. RPI of 51, just above the bubble, but I think they're being rewarded for playing the 31st toughest schedule in the United States. Uh, also invited was Arizona State, an RPI of 44 underneath the bubble, uh, and Nebraska, RPI of 48 right at the bubble. Again, if you ask Dominetrics, Nebraska is the 80th best team in the country. Arizona State is 74th best. Uh, Xavier is 51st. Kansas State is 58th. Now, uh, to explore these teams further, there's a pattern that emerges. In this table, I've listed the four teams Dominetrics would select at the top, Florida State, Illinois, California, and San Francisco versus the four that actually got picked, Xavier, Kansas State, Arizona State, and Nebraska. What you'll notice is that with regard to the most important dimension of performance, they're all roughly on a par, uh, playing opponents that won between 56 and 58% of their games. Opponents' opponents' winning percentages are also somewhat similar, ranging 51, 53, 55. Where the differences are, are in dimensions two and four. 
recall that the second most important dimension of performance is your own winning percentage away from home, on the road and at neutral sites. And when the going gets tough on the road and at neutral sites, the tough get going, and Florida State, Illinois, and San Francisco win more than half of their games away from home. California wins 40% of their games away from home. In contrast, in this second most important dimension of performance, Xavier, Kansas State, Arizona State, and Nebraska all win less than 40% of their games. All right, 37 and a half if you're Xavier, a third of your away from home games if you're Kansas State or Arizona State. And for Nebraska, just 26 and two thirds percent of their games away from home they win, but they got selected. Where these teams redeem themselves, apparently in the eyes of the selection committee, is with their play at home. There's no doubt about the fact that these four that got picked do very well in their home games, winning between 87.5 and 94% of those home games, whereas these four that didn't get selected do worse at home, winning between 62.5 and 76% of their home games. But if you look at those cardinal coefficients that the NCAA has subjectively chosen to go with, they do imply that your performance on the road and in neutral sites is more important than your performance at home. So my ultimate critique would be of this year's field that uh, the selection committee failed to take note of what's more important and what's less important according to their own RPI uh, with regard to where the games are played. So um, uh, some folks like to uh, uh, look at uh, the represent representation across conferences. Dominetrics again would uh, invite more teams from the ACC where you have to play at Duke and at Syracuse and at North Carolina and so forth uh, than in some of these other conferences. Uh, just finally, and I'll be happy to take questions, uh, you can always look up uh, the rankings at our website, uh, which is part of the Economics Department website here at Beloit College. Okay, so uh, uh, thanks very much for listening and I'm happy to entertain questions. Uh, our Associate Dean uh, uh, Charles Westerberg is raising his hand for those uh, uh, listening at home. <laughs> uh, Bob, why do you think the, uh, the NCAA Selection Committee uh, is sticking with RPI and hasn't immediately adopted the dominatrix? <laughs> um, well, I, I think um, they may not be aware of the dominatrix. Uh, maybe I should... Uh, uh, join with Scott and, and write them a letter about this. <laughs> um, but um, the RPI uh, is a metric that is well known uh, nowadays. They've been using it for some time. And um, one does see other metrics emerging. If you watch ESPN nowadays, they have started to cite this thing called the BPI. Uh, and uh, I, I can't tell you how the BPI is, is computed. Um, but uh, I think that they can defend the RPI a little bit with regard to the uh, actual performance of home teams. Uh, the 1.3 and the 0.7 that would be implied by the record of home teams is not far off from the 1.4 and the 0.6 that they use. So I think that that's somewhat defensible, but the weights uh, in uh, the RPI itself, after you make those adjustments, are entirely subjective. Uh, and um, again, they benefit some teams more than others. And if you look at Wichita State, their RPI is fourth best in the country. And that does merit a one C. Uh, 
Uh, again, um, what dominatrix uh, forces us to consider is the actual number in that most important dimension of performance, the 54.53% uh, games won by Wichita State's opponents, and that's 94th best in the country. And if you play the 94th toughest schedule, Dominetrics would say we can't ignore that, and we, we can't give you a one seed, um, and the best we can do is a nine. Uh, I promised uh, Chuck to check in on his alma mater, uh, Missouri, uh, uh, 55, unfortunately, just a little bit below the bubble. <laughs> uh, Tim? Are they, uh, do you think that there are other variables that are in untangibles that maybe should be included that are not being included in this? I mean, we, obviously we can look at injuries, but outside of that? Uh, uh, well, um, yeah, I think intangibles matter. We were talking a little bit before today's talk about uh, the injury to one of Kansas's best players. Um, and I think that is material, but our Excel program is just never going to take that into account. But I like it that way. It keeps the analysis dispassionate. And there are so many passions that uh, emerge with regard to um, college basketball, that if we want to maximize objectivity, we've got to have a methodology that sets those passions aside. So I like the fact that Dominetrics just sticks with these numbers that uh, apply to these four dimensions of performance. Yes, Coach? Would the numbers be any different uh, if everybody played an equal number of games you know you have uh, certain certainly tournaments and different things that play a role in and how that would affect uh, you know the overall numbers in comparison with the dominatrix versus the, the RPI uh, I think uh, the ability to go deep into a conference tournament helps and uh, as you do you are winding up playing more games than other teams that might have gotten knocked out of their conference tournaments in the first round, or from teams uh, in the Ivy League, for example, that has no conference tournament. I think this benefited uh, North Carolina State, uh, which is around here somewhere. Well, they actually uh, ranked 36th uh, for Dominetrix. Uh, Joe Lenardi, uh, a luminary bracketologist for ESPN, did not have NC State in the tournament, but they got as far as the semifinals of the ACC tournament, and in each one of those games, you're playing a team that's got a good record. And so your opponent's winning percentage is improving with each of those games. Uh, your D1, the most important dimension of performance. So I think that helped NC State. And they're also winning those conference games on a neutral floor. That's helping on the second most important dimension of performance as well. So I do think that these postseason conference tournaments uh, do make a difference in the final week of the, not the regular season, but kind of the first week of the postseason. And I think we want it that way. Uh, teams need an incentive to do well in those conference tournaments that would otherwise just be meaningless revenue generators. Oh, we actually have a um, question that came through YouTube. Very it looks good. like it's from your collaborator. Okay. It says, great talk, Bob. With new indices and statistical analysis like ours, has the committee improved their selections over time? Um, well, uh, uh, I couldn't say. I mean, I don't think that they uh, ever do a really bad job. Um, in the years that we've been making our dominatrix rankings, there have never been more than about three or four areas of disagreement between the teams that we would invite and those that uh, are actually invited. Uh, but there again, I, I don't think that Dominetrix is on the radar screen of the selection committee as yet. And so um, there's no way to say if, if they're benefiting from our input across time. 
you do uh, when you hear interviews with the chair of the selection committee uh, after each field of 68 is announced, that chair typically references many tools of analysis that uh, the committee used to select their field. Um, and Scott and I would be thrilled if Dominetrics simply became one of their tools of analysis. Uh, that would be our own uh, uh, goal with regard to this. Again, I, I think it is the RPI that's the primary tool, especially as you look at uh, these last four teams that did get selected uh, versus our four that we think should have been selected. Uh, the FSU RPI is 54. Uh, the Illinois RPI is 70. California, 63. San Francisco, 67. Again, for the teams that got in, their RPIs are 47 for Xavier, 51 for Kansas State, 44 for Arizona State, 48 for Nebraska. So I think it is pretty clear that the RPI is the major metric that they're looking at. Um, we would just encourage them to consider uh, our metric, metric our, our dominetric as well. All right, we have another question. This is from Richard Russell, also coming from YouTube. It says, have you ever considered incorporating margin of victory? If Wichita State blows away all of its opponents by 20 to 25 points each, does it matter that much that they're collectively weak? Uh, there's a gentleman from MIT named Jeff Sagarin who has uh, college basketball rankings that are posted once a week in the USA Today, and he does take margin of victory into account. Um, Dominetrics does not, uh, and again, I think that's fine. I would submit that a win is a win and a loss is a loss, and uh, when games start to get out of hand and uh, a winning team stretches their lead from 10 to 20 to 30 points, I don't really believe that that should necessarily affect how we uh, rank that team relative to its rivals around the country. Oh, uh, uh, Coach has another question. <laughs> Two of them, okay, very good. <laughs> so, so going off of um, the previous question, um, when you look at a team like Wichita State, who Dominetrics has ranked a little bit lower, uh, obviously, than the RPI, um, wouldn't there be any like argument that that's what they should do? Um, you know that they, if we're looking at the you know the strength of opponent schedules and, and different things, um, you know, road road wins uh, and, and the percentage that's involved there, that uh, they should be 34 and 0. If we if we look at it that way, um, does that play a role into this? And uh, then, sure, I, I that's a great point that that I d should concede. If if you're playing uh, uh, a set of opponents that uh, maybe don't win as many games as uh, uh, some of the opponents that higher ranked teams play, the next thing to look at is are they winning those games against these lesser opponents by wider margins? And that indeed I think is precisely the time to, to bring in margin of victory. Uh, uh, again, we don't do that. Uh, it would be interesting to look at the Sagarin ratings and, and see what they say about Wichita State. Sure. Yeah. And then the other question I had was, so if you look at some of the power conferences, uh, the Big Ten I think is a great example um, where uh, you'd have a team like um, you know Wisconsin or Michigan who wouldn't play everybody in the conference twice in a particular season because of the way that the scheduling is done. Mm -hmm. um, how how would, do you think that that plays a role into – um, you know everything when it, the rain, the rankings and stuff are complete. Oh, I I think just by virtue of being in a power conference, uh, that's going to help your uh, numerical outcome in this most important dimension of performance. Uh, in the Big Ten, you're going to be playing 18 games against teams that. Uh, 
range from Michigan and Michigan State, uh, who win 75 to 80 percent of their games, down to maybe as, as low as Northwestern, which still wins about 50 percent of its games. So virtually everybody you're playing wins more than half of their games. And given that opponent's winning percentage is the most important dimension of performance, you're going to get uh, wind in your sails just by being a member of the Big Ten. Uh, and um, having said that, uh, you still need to uh, take care of your own business in terms of winning your own games, especially when you go on the road and play at neutral sites. So uh, there's good news and bad news, I would say, for Big Ten teams. You're, you're going to get a good opponent's winning percentage but the second most important dimension of performance has to do with winning away from home. And again, winning away from home at Michigan State and Michigan and so forth is, is very difficult. You face taller challenges when you go on the road for a Big Ten Conference game, again, than I think Wichita State faces when they go on the road for a Missouri Valley Conference game. Well, uh, shall we wrap today's uh, lunchbox talk up? Uh, thank, okay, well, th thanks very much for those of you who attended uh, here in the Moore Study Lounge. And for those of you who watched at home and asked these great questions via the website. <laughs> thanks. <laughs>